All right, hello everyone. Yeah, so today in the lesson, I'll show you examples of uh, unconventional creative moves. And uh, well, I'll just start by saying that this is something that uh, potentially cost me in winning the US championship, not being able to spot unusual creative moves. Um, so it's very important to be flexible minded and uh, be able to consider all sorts of moves even those that don't first come to mind um, because that will broaden your um, board vision and at some point that could make a very big difference in your chess. So we'll start with some relatively easier puzzles on that, on that topic, but um, <clears throat> then we're gonna see some examples from, <clears throat> from my, my US championship just now and uh, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So. Let's uh, <clears throat> start with uh, this one. This one is black to play, and uh, the question is, can black do better than, let's say, just recapturing on d4? Of course, recapturing on d4 is uh, kind of a safe, solid move, but does black have anything better? And I mean, I guess to make it easier for you, there, most of the moves that we're gonna be talking about are a little bit unusual, right? So you have to, you're forced to think outside the box. So I guess in a way that helps helps you a little bit. Obviously during the game, no one will tell you, but um, yeah. So it's bishop e2? Okay, so someone on YouTube also mentioned bishop e2. Yeah, bishop e2 is a very logical idea, but the thing is then of course, white will play rook e1, right? And then, the question is how exactly do we follow up? Because if bishop c4, there's rook c4. And uh, if rook d4, bishop e2, rook e4, it's nothing special again. Bishop f1, bishop f3, like anything. So bishop e2 is an interesting try, but at least in this moment, it's not gonna you know, bring you anything special. But we, we should have that idea in our reserve and maybe we can try to play something to make that idea stronger. Some people are also typing in the chat bishop e6, but bishop e6 doesn't really have a threat. Uh, so even if we play a random move like f3 or rook e1, it's, uh, bishop e6 doesn't exactly do anything. It's just hoping that he takes, but then we go knight e2, but of course uh, he's not gonna take it and then it's nothing so special. Um, so we have to try to actually make a threat. Bishop e2 does make a threat to the rook, but he can move the rook away. So let's try to be creative here. How can we maybe disturb his harmony to make this move more powerful? Similar idea. If we play rook fe8, then we'll play, I don't know, f3 or rook e1. Like it's, uh, he can play many moves to, to kind of um, be solid. Knight h3. Well, knight h3, I don't think doesn't, does anything because after takes, what's the, what's the follow up? F5, yeah, unfortunately we can't play F5 because the pawn is pinned. But even if we could, you know, the knight will move away and doesn't do anything. All right, looks like Maurice Smashley got the right idea, but make sure you give the follow-up to your move. Don't just give the move, give me the follow-up. That's very important here. So rook d4 is of course a move, but the question of course was specifically presented, is there anything better than rook d4? Rook d4 is a neutral move, but then he, he can play rook e1, f3, and nothing special. So, so Maurice smashly got the move, but, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, 
but a regular. okay see <laughs> but uh we need to make sure we find the follow-up to that move like if 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 he plays the most natural move what does black do Yes, so we play b5, that's the idea, right? And after this, we go bishop e2. Yeah, so um, this, is the, this is the idea. So this pawn move is very good, right? Disturbs his harmony, and then after the bishop takes, we go bishop e2, and now the difference, the bishop's not protected, and he will lose material no matter what. So very nice creative out of the box thinking move, right? Which is why we have to be open-minded and considering all of our checks captures threats. So when we see a move like bishop e2 and you see why it doesn't work, we have to consider, okay, maybe we can try to play that on move two in some, in some lines and we have to be flexibly minded here. So I like this puzzle a lot, like out of the box thinking. Um, all right, so let's look at uh, the next one. Um, all right, black to play. What should black do? In this position, black has one winning move. If, if you don't play the winning move, you're losing. So this is uh, this is a one of these where you really have to. No yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you take the if you take the knight, then I'll take queen takes, and then what do you want to do? Uh, a3, maybe. Okay, but then I can probably take, and yeah, yeah. you still don't really have big threats. I mean, even a b is not a huge threat. I mean, I can also play b3, so I don't think you're accomplishing that much. It's in this case, and you're also trading off your pretty good bishop here. Hmm. All right, looks like one person on YouTube got it. So let's see if um, anyone, okay, two people got it, okay. On YouTube, people are starting to get it. Uh, Okay, I think we're gonna start going over it. Um, so A3 is a, 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 a common choice amongst people. Um, but the problem is Knight C6. And the thing is A3 does not have a powerful threat actually, surprisingly. Like white still, you know, white can also attack a lot of things and A3 does not have any real powerful threats just yet. Um, Hmm? Knight g2. Knight g2, yes. Um, if rook c4, rook c4 does not really work. Somebody suggested that. Knight g2, yes. We have to, the way we find that move is we have to just look at all of our checks, captures, threats, right? Knight g2 doesn't seem like the most natural, but moving the knight away from the center, but yet it just disturbs the, the harmony, right? The queen is becomes overloaded and he, white cannot really defend. If queen e2, of course, we just go bishop d4. Pretty simple. Um... So the queen, if queen d3 knight here also. So queen c3 is kind of the only move to try to hold everything together. And now how does black continue here? Well, 
I mean, that's true. Yeah, A3 is also kind of interesting, but maybe B3 is not that bad still here. Ninety one, very good. Ninety one is very strong. Yeah, rook b three somebody suggested, but rook b three I think uh, even if we do queen b three it doesn't seem like so clearly winning. So yes, um I believe ninety one is uh, very strong and uh if rook here then we play knight takes f three. And queen f three, rook b two, and uh and that's winning. So black just little by little disturbs his harmony and makes white's position um, falls apart. Starting with this very nice move, knight g2, then the rook, queen has to move, rook has to move, and then white's harmony is messed up. All right, so now let's do this one. This one is uh, white to play. White to play and win. Try to give the whole variation. Uh, thank you, Eric. It's okay. Give it a shot. Bishop d6. Um, but bishop d6, actually, I don't have to take, right? What if I go bishop e6? Rook takes e5. Yeah, I'm not sure because yeah, that, that the queen's hanging. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, if I go bishop e6 now, you're suddenly pinned up a little bit, right? Doesn't seem like we want to play like that. Uh, knight d6 is yeah. We have to try to give the whole variation, right? Not just not just one move, but try to give the the whole line. Um, Okay, so of course the correct move is uh, knight d6. Uh, that's the most natural move. Bishop takes d6. Now, here we have a choice. We have queen a6 and bishop takes d6. Um, bishop takes d6 looks completely winning. But black has a surprising defense here. Uh, what is it? Okay, I think somebody found the, the line, the right line. Doan, I think, found the right idea. So we're not gonna uh, say yet what it is, but first let's try to find the defense for black here after bishop d6, bishop d6. Because yeah, here it looks like it's winning. Queen a6 is a threat and, and uh, looks like it's uh, almost no way. But black has a fantastic defense here after which he's not worse. King b7 does not work because if king b7 check here, queen f5, we get overloaded. So we can't go king b7, unfortunately. So, but yeah, the move for black here is very nice, the defensive move. Also, speaking of unnatural moves, it's not the most natural move, but it's uh, okay. E king master puppets. You're right. That's one of these two. But which one? There's a big difference. I was going to say one of those. Oh, rook d f eight. 
Rook D F8. Uh, Rook D F8. I think you're losing here because Queen A6 check. King here is forced. Queen A5 check. Now if King C7, Queen C King C8, Queen C7 is mate. You have to go King E8 and then Rook E5. So unfortunately, that does not save us. So yes, uh, uh, Aaron is correct. We play Bishop E8. If we go bishop e6, we also get mated. So actually by process of elimination, it's bishop e8. And amazingly enough, this is not clear because if you do this same thing, amazingly enough, white is lost here because uh, our queen is attacked by the bishop. Our bishop on a4 is offside and black has threats. Black threatens the queen, black threatens rook d6 and black threatens queen f1. And in some cases, black threatens the rook and white's gonna lose material and lose the game. So that's just insane. Queen c4, king takes d6. And black will escape and he's up a rook and he wins. Now I think white does not have to go queen a6. I mean, I think this line somehow ends in a draw. I don't remember how, but this is why bishop takes d6 is not the most accurate. It looks winning, but amazingly there's this bishop e8 defense, right? So we have to really look at opponent set ideas. So the correct line is queen a6 check. Of course, king b8 loses routinely. Two bishop takes d6, king a8, bishop takes c6. So he has to go king c7, queen a7, king c8. And this is where we have this very nice unnatural move that I want you guys to try to see if you can find. White, of course, can, is guaranteed to draw here. Queen check here, here, and black cannot go here because of mate. Right, so white is guaranteed a draw, but white wants more than the draw. What is the only way white can get more than the draw? I think somebody on YouTube already found it, but let's see if anyone else finds it. Um. It's this, again, it involves disturbing opponent's harmony to make the threat and at the same time we disturb opponent's harmony. It's a very nice idea. Very good. Uh, yes, the correct idea is the brilliant bishop b5. Bec if, takes, if takes queen a6, and now we. Yeah, because the diff we, we got rid of that pawn, right? We disturb their harmony. With our pawn on c6 holds everything, but we get rid of that pawn, and then we set up the mate. So bishop b5 has three purposes we're threatening mate, we're trying to get rid of this pawn. And we're, more importantly, we're stopping queen f1 mate. That, that's why I was looking at it. Yeah, because it, it seemed like the only thing. But I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah, because after cb, we have this brilliant queen a6 and, and white is winning. Okay. It's just fantastic idea. So, so, so we have to be flexibly minded, right? A lot, as you can already see, very often we have to consider these moves that maybe sacrifices, disturbs opponent's harmony. Because by doing that, we might give up a, a pawn or even a piece, but we break something in opponent's coordination, and as a result, we can accomplish what we want. So disturbing opponent's harmony is like a very important, important theme in chess. Um, all right, now this one: white to play and uh, and win. How should white? Um, how should white play? Again, this is all I'm giving you challenging stuff because I know that uh, on YouTube a lot of very strong players are watching and, and so that way you know, there's a little bit of something for, for everyone. Um, so two more puzzles and then I'm going to show you <laughs> my... 
unfortunate moments in the US Championship, which basically cost me the, the title. But let's do these ones first and then we'll get there. So H7 looks very natural. Actually, in my opinion, it does not look natural. And for one specific reason, this bishop on G6 is horrible, right? Wouldn't you rather play rook G7 and trap it and then just promote the pawn? The problem with playing H7 is that after takes takes, uh, I think we're only trying to lose here, right? Because after the pawn goes to A3, king B4, B5, our king is, this king is stuck with these pawns, right? And uh, our rook is busy stopping our pawn, right? So I think we're only trying to lose, and probably we are losing here. So this is definitely not the way we, we want to play. Now, rook g7 is, of course, is very tempting, but the problem is what you're going to do after a3. That's what you have to calculate. Because if we take here, and then we go a2, this one also stops our pawn, right? And then we, we're going to get mated. And this is not going to be good. All right, looks like Roberto Molina got... Wait, I think this is an I, international master, right? I think, if, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe there's... Maybe he's... Uh, maybe there's a, another person with the same name. Uh, uh, I could be wrong. Um, I, I th oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's you, okay. <laughs> That's him. Okay, yeah, because I heard this name before. Yeah, that's. See, I, 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 I told you guys there are some very strong players here. So, uh, okay. Uh, so we have an IM in the house watching live. That's that's good. So you guys have a uh, tough competition. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So here's the here's the point of this problem, right? So. Rook g7 is a move you really want to play, but after a3, um, we cannot take that. And if we go back rook a7, this is still not quite winning, because after rook a6, bishop h7, rook here, we go king c3. And uh, this is going to be a draw. Like, we're not going to be able to win this. All we can do is we keep, keep checking, 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 but it's going to be a draw. So the idea here is we actually play rook a7. Putting black in Zugzwang. And why is it Zugzwang, you may ask? Well, let's see. The bishop can't move. The, these black pawns can't move. If the king goes anywhere like c6 or something, we lose the a4 pawn. So the only move that does not lose material is king b4. But now, what we can do is a brilliant move. Rook back to g7. So we, it seems unnatural. Why are we forcing the king to go to b4, where it wants to go anyway? But the difference is now we go here. And after this, we've disturbed their harmony. Because after this, look, we go rook check. We have this check now because the king is on b4. And after here, we go back and then we stop this pawn by with the check and we win the game. So sometimes we can literally lose a whole tempo like that in an end game just to disturb their harmony and just to improve our coordination. So fantastic. Okay, so let's... Uh, Okay, this, this one will be kind of challenging. So, but since we have an IM here, that's actually good. This, hopefully, this is going to be a good one. I think I, th I think this will be actually. A well, we'll see unless he knows this one. So, white to play, white to play and win. I mean, this is a very hard one, but if uh, but I I just think it kind of ex shows a very nice. There's a nice, very nice point to it. I think it's. A, aesthetically be beautiful, which is why I kind of wanna, uh, wanted to show this one. This is actually from Dvoryatsky, Mark Dvoryatsky. Um, so why to move and win? I mean, there are many ways we can probably get the draw, but we're trying to win here.
you know what's funny? I think one person had had the answer correct, and he's and then he says, uh, and then then I think he kind of corrected himself, and uh, actually he had the right move the first time. It's kind of interesting. I, I don't want to say yet who it is, but uh, it's. Um, all right, it looks like one person got Andre Fidalgo. Um, maybe he's also a, a, a masked uh, IM or GM. Uh, so, yeah, so the thing is, okay, there are many ways we can try. If we go Rook G1, we can go, ah, NM, I see. We can, yeah, then there's Queen D4 or Queen C3 and and stuff like that, and it's not so clear. Please don't spam in the chat. Um, and um, if we play rook e6, king here, <laughs> rook h5, king g8, the queen also starts um, escaping, right? So another move that we can try is rook f2, but still after queen d4, queen c3, black gets a lot of counterplay. So the brilliant point here is that we have this move, rook 1e5. Uh, insane move. Um, we give up the rook, but after de, we go rook f2 and uh, we go check and we win the queen. And because black's beautiful friends, his pawns, the queen's friends, are, are stopping uh, the queen's escape route, black will lose the queen for the rook. And the point is, white has this pawn majority on the queen side and he will play a5, b6 and win the game. And that was another very important thing to pay attention to, to realize that if you actually can exchange two rooks for the queen, you're winning. So this was, uh, this was not, this is actually a puzzle. This is not a, I don't think this is from a real game. This is a, this is just a puzzle. All right, now from real games. You might think these things are only relevant from puzzles, but you'll see five examples of mine where I missed very nice opportunities and you'll see how, why it's important to be creative. So first of all, good memory. Well, mixed memory. So this is from the US Open that I won right, you know, in August, right before US Championship. I got eight and a half out of nine, but I came this close to getting, breaking history and getting nine out of nine. Um, and this was uh, my game, last round game against Benjamin Gladura a grandmaster who lives in St. Louis right now, originally from Hungary. And um, and then I kind of outplayed him at some point. I got a very good endgame. And uh, and here in this position, he offered me a draw. And a draw clinched me clear first. Uh, so, you know, I thought for about seven minutes, I didn't find a clear way to win. Like I was looking at several ways. I knew I'm probably at least slightly better, but I didn't quite realize um, that I'm completely winning here. Um, and uh, the winning idea here is actually very unusual, very creative, and somehow it never even crossed my mind. And my opponent immediately told me after the game that uh, about it and how it was, it was winning. And uh, yeah, it's a big pity that I didn't, I was not open-minded. And also I kind of feel upset that I didn't pay attention to this weakness of mine after the, the US Open because I could have worked on that before US Championship and maybe my result in the US Championship would have been different, but you know, you, I guess you live, you learn, and uh, um, everything happens for a reason. So anyway, without further ado, try to find the best idea here for Black, uh, Black's, Black's plan. And yes, I am reading the chat, so you guys could suggest your, your ideas, and so please say nice things here. Um, All right, looks like Kibitzer's chess castling got it. So, so far we have one guy who got a correct idea, 
uh, we have one idea. One person said d4, one person says c4, and then we have also bishop takes f4. So all of these are pretty natural moves. I, I considered all these moves that were... Okay, one other person got the right answer, Mr. Balhots. Ah, uh, hi. Uh, good, uh, good day, Mr. Mr. Villa Flores. Um, okay, so let's go over the most natural possibilities first. Um, so I I consider d4, but then I thought um, if d4, then he can uh, play c4 or even take, and king e2. And I thought uh, it's not so easy. The pawn is it's getting blockaded, or even c4 maybe is, is possible move. I was also considering c4, but c4 knight b4, bishop takes pawn takes, king here, king there, and the problem is if I ever go king c5, he checks me away, and. Um, it's not so easy. I was mostly looking at king c6, and the idea is king e2. And then I wanted to take that. And, uh, no, sorry, I wanted to take on d3. I was considering taking on d3, then going king b5. But his king kind of just gets there in time to c2. And it's, uh, it's a good winning chance, but it's not quite, quite winning. Um, and I thought, OK, it's, uh, it's no big deal. Um, I didn't see a clear win, so I just said, okay, let's make a draw. Uh, I should have, of course, spent more time and look, be more, more open-minded and just be more, try to look more for creative options. And yeah, if I did that, maybe I would have had a chance. But the thing about creative moves is that you know, the only way you can find them is if you look for them. Right? Otherwise, they're not going to just come to your head. Right? You have to force yourself to look for them. That's the thing about chess. And I think the way you get better is doing studies and seeing yourself more these puzzles and then you're more likely to be flexibly minded to find that. The correct idea is a uh, brilliant um, h5. And uh, the point is you want to play h4, h3. You make a passed pawn, right? And then once you make a passed pawn, you're going to have two passed pawns at some point, d4 as well. And then you're not going to really be able to hold the position. And the problem is after king e2, h4, he cannot take on d5 because we go h3 and the pawn's unstoppable. The pawn is literally unstoppable. And of course, if he ever takes it, then there's c4. So some, but somehow this idea of h5, h4, h3 just never crossed my mind. Like somehow this move seemed unnatural to me, like putting the pawn on pre like that. But you know, once you go over it, it's actually a very logical move. And of course, if I find that move, it's almost certain I'm winning the game. It's, Minus four, minus five, something like that on the engine. And the he's he's more or less losing the knight. Yeah, he's uh, that's kind of almost the best line for white. Like he really cannot, he cannot do anything to, to save the, the game anymore. So I th and I think my opponent even said that he was gonna give up the knight somehow. What's a good source to find studies puzzles to build the ability to find creative moves? Yeah, I think that's something that I probably can answer maybe in a, in a week or two because that's something I've also asked a few other people. But I think so far the answers I've got are um, maybe Dvoretsky and Agur. Those would be the, the really challenging uh, guys to study. I think Dvoretsky has a lot of these kind of creative puzzles and uh, unnatural ideas. So maybe, maybe Dvoretsky. Uh, why can't C4? Well, C4, it's... Uh, it's not really winning, right? Because takes, takes, king d6, king g2, as I already mentioned, king goes to g3. And if you try to go king c5, d4, then here. If you go, um, if you go h5, king e1, no, sorry, 90, 91, yeah, then the difference is that after this, you bring the king to c4 and you're gonna make another pass pawn. And, uh, and white will not be able to defend both weaknesses. You know, in chess, there's a pr something called principle of two weaknesses, right? You have to create sec two weaknesses to win the game. And here you, um, white cannot defend against all the weaknesses. Like in the long run, this b2 is very weak. This pawn, you have to worry about. This pawn, d4, you have to worry about, right? So white just cannot hold on to everything here and defend all the weaknesses. Uh, what is better, tactical puzzles or calculation puzzles? 
Yeah, I think it depends on your level. If you're, I would say if you're above 2000, then probably calculation, but maybe like below 2000, especially below 1600, I think it's more important to be familiar with tactical patterns. Um, so I think it depends on your tactical level. Like if you can do, if you're over 3000 on chess.com puzzle rush, I'm sorry, chess.com tactical trainer or something. And uh, if you can get over 30 on like puzzle rush, then I guess your tactics are pretty good. Like you're able to see simple patterns pretty quickly. Then I think calculation is more important, but 3000 on chess.com tactics. Yeah. I would say that's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think that's, that's, that's roughly equivalent to around 2000 tactical level in my estimation. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, but if let's say you're like below, below 2000 on chess.com tactics and or um, puzzle rush, you can't get past 20, then I would say tactical patterns are still something you would rather work on more rather than calculation. Um, okay, let's continue. Um, okay, so this is a game I played in round two of the US Championship uh, against John Burke, a um, young player who is lowest rate, but he did really decently in the tournament. Very dangerous young player. And um, yeah, we had a very interesting fighting game. Um, and um, we both had chances in this game, I would say. Now there was um, now this was a very very interesting moment right here. So <clears throat> when I played Bishop F6, my opponent here uh, played his move pretty quickly. He played uh, Rook C4. I guess he pre-planned it and he played it kind of automatically. Um, does anyone see maybe a better move than than Rook C4? But but. One thing though is about this is you have to, you have to calculate, uh, you have to calculate till the end here, because uh, it's uh, it's a bit uh, it's a bit un it's a bit unnatural. Sorry, I yeah, yeah there that's it. very unconventional tactic that we, we both missed. Yes, Salome, yes, I, I remember. Yeah. Queen c4 here. Um, Queen c4 here, I think it's, it's interesting. The thing is I can probably take on f3 here. Uh, maybe I don't have to take on c3, it's, it's interesting. You almost got it. I would say the better option is to uh, to take on e4. And originally I was thinking I can take on c3. In retrospect, the best move is probably something like queen g7, which I also saw I can do, but I thought I can actually get away with bishop c3. And John kind of told, so told me that, yeah, yeah, he didn't think I had anything. But the thing is though, in this position, white has an insanely strong move, which is, what move, which more or less wins the game. Like it's, uh, it's quite incredible. Very, very nice un unconventional move. It stops like Black's, one of Black's key ideas. If you go e5, I think knight e4 is, is kind of uh, good for Black. Queen d2 does not work because of knight takes e4. And then we attack the queen and the bishop here. We need to make sure the knight on c5 is not going to be able to. Yeah, but then, then we lose our bishop. 
So yes, we need, you need, we need to set up queen uh, c4, but in a way that our bishop will not be attacked next move. So ef rook f5 is what we both calculated, and then I think it doesn't really do much. So this move in here is very nice. Bishop a1, still knight e4. If the knight can get to e4, it's not that easy, because then we have rook a5, rook a1 ideas. Queen c4, that's it, yes. Because now the knight is spinned and we're threatening queen d4. And white is winning. It's a very nice... There might still be more to it, but, um, but the engine says white's winning. So this is... Yeah, this is a very neat idea that we both missed. A very nice unconventional idea. So again, we have to be open-minded considering material sacrifice. Like not all automatically assume a, some recapture. But then... After he missed this, there was, it was my turn to miss something later in the game. Yeah. So, the oh, you mean like here? Oh, because queen c4 pins the knight, right? No. So, oh, you mean queen c4 e, e, instead of, uh, well, he does not have to take the rook. Yeah, that's the big thing. Yeah, he does not have to take the rook. Of course, if he takes the rook, then yes. Then this is very good for white. But he doesn't have to take the rook here. So Fe, you're trying to get him to take the rook. Oh, that's the point. Because if you don't take the rook, it's there are some other problems, I think, here. Like now you can go rook c4, and then the four pawn is weak. So, I mean, it's a little complicated, but it's, you know, you can get the idea. Okay, you can always check this game on, on your own if you want. It's in the database. My game against Burke, more carefully with the engine. But, and now it was my turn to miss something. So here, uh, I'll, I'll put the question to you in a different way. What do you guys think about bishop c5? Is that a good move or a bad move? Why or why not for white? Well, yeah, I mean, there are bishops. Well, bishop c3, I think, is a, a little anti-positional because then we we're, we're end up having stuck with a bad bishop against a good knight, I think. So that, I think, and then our a5 pawn is very weak. So I think this would be positionally just very good. So bishop c5 is a very interesting idea. We're trying to get a pass the d pawn. So what do you guys think about that move? Very good, yes, somebody mentioned the right. The reason bishop c5 is not good is because we don't, you see the problem is we automatically, when we calculate, we automatically assume a recapture somehow. Like that's just how the brain works. And uh, somehow I was not disciplined. That's when he played bishop c5, I immediately took on c5. I just somehow had it programmed in my head that I have to capture back. But I don't understand why I couldn't stop for an extra 10 seconds and ask myself, can I do anything else? Think about all the legal moves, at least the captures, and realize that I can take on a5. And, uh, and that's just much better than, uh, than taking on c5. And now white is clearly, black's clearly a little better in this position. Even if he takes here, here, white has to play something like rook b1, but this is, um, I would say, fairly awkward. So yes, so this is another example of being open-minded, right? Not automatically, don't automatically assume a recapture. Bishop d6, we could play rook takes a5. And, and something very similar happened, and uh, unfortunately in my round 9 game against uh, Sam Shankland. So we had a very interesting uh, opening. He found a very in new idea, a very interesting fight. The position was equal, but then he kind of went to a, for a fight with bishop h3 and, uh, and knight a3. He, instead, of, instead of trying to force a draw, he decided to try to play in an interesting way. Okay, so the first question is here. What should white do here after this knight a3 move?
Ah, okay, I see. Okay, so some people have, have seen the analysis. Okay, then, 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 then of course. I saw the two of you going over in the club. Ah. Yeah, the correct idea is bishop a4 here, stopping knight c2, because knight c2 will guarantee him at least a draw. And then he took on b2, and somehow when we both calculated this, we just assumed, okay, he has to, you have to take recapture on b2. I mean, otherwise the rook is trapped, like how can there be anything else, right? But amazingly enough, <laughs> black is not actually threatening to take the rook, because then we have bishop a3, bishop f8 threat. We regain the knight. And then we're going to win back the exchange. So bishop takes a1. I didn't realize that it's not actually a threat. The position is very weird. The knight on a3 is like misplaced. This position is non-standard. And whenever the position is non-standard, you have to approach it also in a non-standard way. You have to be open-minded to look at different new ideas, flexible ideas. And it turns out that even a simple move like knight d5 would give white a clear advantage, right? Because I don't want to take on b2, help the rook get to b2, and help him get counterplay. I would rather play a waiting move. Because now if he takes here, I will go here and, uh, you know, I can play up a pawn here, right? And then simply much better. But the best move it would be here, bishop b3. Uh, and the reason bishop b3 is better than knight d5 and of course, that's something that once you see the idea that you don't have to take on b2 automatically, you know, it's possible for a GM to realize that, okay, like, what are different ways I can play? And bishop b3 is better because uh, the knight does not always have to leave c7 in some lines. Because here, this is clearly better for white, just up a pawn. And after this, if he goes bishop g7, the point is we can take, take, and then... We don't have to go knight d5. We can play g4 with the idea of rook d7. And in some cases, the bishop even gets trapped. Like it's knight d5, knight f4 idea. So long story short, his best move here is bishop e5. And even then, you don't take the rook immediately. You go knight d5 with the idea of knight e7, knight c6. And some very interesting, <coughs> very interesting tactics. For example, if rook e8, knight e7, kick g7, knight c6. If the rook moves, then knight e5, and rook e5, the bishop b2, and pins the rook. So, like, white is just doing really well everywhere. But the thing is, you don't have to actually calculate all that ahead of time. You, you just know that at, the le at least you could, uh, at least you can take the rook, that you have that in your pocket. You have that extra pawn. But then once you're here, you can say, okay, maybe I can do something better, and you kind of think again, right? So the, po the lesson is whenever... Whenever the position is unclear and like weird in many ways, like un unusual, you have to look for unusual ideas. Like you, it's a very important not to be very disciplined and not just automatically just go ahead and recapture. Like just because the move is obvious, looks obvious, looks like the only move. Like you should not just uh, kind of, you know, um, do take it automatically. Right, so that's uh, that's the idea, and uh, and it takes a lot of discipline, right? But that's why I suggest everyone to, when you play, especially online or over the board, try not to move within ten seconds, right? Try to you know think for about ten seconds or see can I maybe do something else? Do I have to play the move that I planned and the move that looks obvious, right? Even if it looks like an automatic recapture, like very obvious. You know, think for 10 seconds, right? It's not going to get you into time pressure, but it can help you find a lot of very nice creative ideas. Um, uh, maybe Richard Report. I don't know. I think Jeffrey Schoenk is also very creative because I never guess any of his moves when I play him. <laughs> so, uh, well, no, in, in, a blitz, in a blitz game, it's different, right? In a blitz game, it's reaction, right? Okay, and I'm not talking about blitz game. Blitz game, rapid 10-2 or something rapid when you're in time pressure, it's different, right? So if you have only like a two-second delay or increment, that's different. Like then, of course, you this does not apply to that, right? That's why for people who play fast, probably too much blitz might not be good, right? Because blitz can develop these habits. But what I'm saying is that when you're playing a classical game over the board or something, when you have 
time to think and you have like an increment or a delay that's at least like 5-10 seconds and you have a lot of time especially early in the game there's no reason to play automatically right you have to be flexibly open-minded right and I think you know if I would have won at least one of these two games right it's already a different term like I was a half a point away from first place right so like I'm not saying I would have won these games but like I had a good chance to win at least one of these two games if I just didn't play automatically and what upset me the most is that I already made a mistake like that against John Burke and then yet I had to make a mistake like this again like it's it's quite incredible because I've never had this problem necessarily before in my career at least it didn't really show up and then in this one most important tournament there you there it happened um what book do you suggest to go over 2000 um yeah I mean look that that's a uh, I don't really like answering questions about books because that's um because that's something that um uh, really just depends on what your your level is and your own strengths and weaknesses are i think it's really very individual things but um yeah that's why for me it's very difficult to answer questions about about books um uh, i guess i'll show you one more a couple of more that i planned for today um the game against ray robson i thought um was very interesting so I had like very good prep, like I happened to study this line, which was kind of lucky. And you know, at some point I even got winning chances. But unfortunately I couldn't find the way to create the best winning chances. And, uh, and so here we have black to play. And the question is, uh, what should black uh, do here? And black has a very nice creative way to, to get a very good winning chances. Yeah, h5 is interesting, but h5, um, okay, it threatens bishop g4, sure, but if I, go, if I go king e4, let's say, which is something I kind of want to do anyway, bring the king to e5, then I think that doesn't accomplish its goals. Bishop e3, uh, I don't think it works, because king e3, if you want to take, I take, rook c3, rook d3, so it does not work. Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, again, it's a nice creative move. And think about, in particular, loose pieces. Like this, in this case, I could have... And this one, actually, I didn't rush. Like, I didn't play instantly. I thought, like, 15 minutes here. Because I was desperately trying to find something. Uh, but I couldn't find. Uh, yeah, so the knights on b3 and the knight here are loose pieces, right? So... There's an idea that kind of takes advantage of these loose pieces. So, Bishop takes d5 and then rook. If we do this, then knight c5 is annoying. And then rook e5, and then he's threatening mate. And he's getting all sorts of counterplay here. Yeah. This I didn't, didn't like, yeah. And I think somebody suggested rook c4. Rook c4, I think the problem was that... What was the issue with rook c4? I'm trying to remember. Maybe it was takes, takes rook, d, rook d6 or something. And um, bishop g4, king g3, and I didn't really think it's that, that amazing. Bishop d4, yes. <laughs> yeah, cutting off communication. Now, somehow I just didn't see this move at all. Like I thought for 15 minutes, I just didn't see it. Right, it's, and again, this is a move that if I find it, it's a, I mean, he was in time pressure and it could have made him like very nervous, right? Objectively, he should draw this. Like it's like here, e4, and I give this check. I think it's like king f2, t then I take, 
then he finds he has to find rook e1, otherwise he's really suffering. And then we get to some rook end game like this. Which the engine says is a draw, but like first of all, he would have had to find all these moves in time pressure, and then even still he needs to hold this endgame. So I would say yes, like I if I was able to be more creative, I had a very good chance to win one, if not two, of these three games. Right. And and that's and now like now we're talking already about like a plus three score, right? That's even not counting like my first round win, my first round draw that I didn't win a winning position, right? So that's, um, so it just goes to show, right? It's, uh, it's important to extract lessons. So what I encourage you to do always is, and of course the most painful moment, right? Like the one against the, the one against Fabi. I'm not gonna really show you the whole game, right? It's, it's just too complex and we're kind of running out of time. But I'll show you the, the moment when like I, I guess I could have hoped to win. Um, it was um, like at some point, yeah, he found some very good moves, queen b2 and knight e5. And at some point I got very excited because I thought here, here I, I, was, I thought I can win with rook e8 and rook b8 and queen a7. And I started having flashbacks of uh, Varakobian against Fabi in 2017 when Var's winning move was also queen a7. Uh, in 2017 after when he made a monumental comeback in that game but the problem is there's knight d7 so then I and then I saw knight e5 like I thought maybe this could be winning I thought wow maybe this could be my lucky day but then unfortunately for me there was queen e5 queen here king f6 and somehow the stupid king escapes like I don't have a check on d8 or something and the king escapes and I spent almost all my time trying to find something here and I didn't and there was nothing. So I played king h1, which was, which was correct. But I guess I was already, like I was playing an increment here, right? And I was already kind of a little bit upset that didn't, wasn't there for me. And then he played rook e5 and he blocked me. And I guess I just got discouraged. I thought, okay, I'm not gonna mate him. I couldn't find anything. And I just played a passive move. Like I played something rook c8 and, I, and then I kind of lost the thread and I ended up losing the game. But here white had an amazing sequence of moves, which would have given me very good winning chances, which of course Fabi missed this and you know we all missed it. It's just like a beautiful concept and unless it's so hard to find even with a lot of time, let alone with, with time pressure, right? But it's, it again <laughs> symbolizes the, the story of my tournament, like just not being able to find a, a creative unnatural move for the, life of, for the life of me, right? And so this was like one last opportunity to make it right and to find like the brilliant move, but it didn't come to me. And the thing is, the problem is it's not enough to just find the move. Although I don't even think I was considering moving the queen away from like f2 square and whatever. But the problem here is that you have to find that if queen f2, there's this rook takes e8. And somehow after this, there's queen h8. The rook locates that. And after this, queen a8, geometrical motif. That's just beautiful. And so that means he has to exchange the queens and play something like knight d3. And, and then, of course, only I'm playing for a win here. Like, I um, can't really lose here. And, uh, like, realistically, I can only win this. And yeah, good chances I win this. And, yeah, so that was, that was obviously a, an opportunity. Although, to find it in time pressure, you know, it's, it was unlikely. But, but yet, it was, it was a chance. So as painful as it is, right, when, when you have a tournament like this, when you clearly see a weakness, like a common pattern, and you see that it's always the same thing, like that's costing you in many games, you have to make note and you have to really work on it, right? So if you ever have a tournament where there is something in particular that prevents you from, you know, from having, you have a decent result and prevents you from having a great result, you know, that's, that means that there's something in particular you got to work on. Um, and that just means that you got to work more on at home to train more regularly at home because ultimately, the, as they say, um, you, you win the tournaments usually before the tournaments. No matter how hard you try during the tournaments, if you're not maximally prepared, then somehow the game of chess, a lot of moves will not open to you at the, when you really need it. So that's why you got to really work, earn it. And uh, there's a reason Wesley so wins so much. 
it might seem like he's not very ambitious during the tournament, but he preserves his energy and but he he works really hard um, at at home. I remember as as a recap, I'll tell you a story about Wesley So, which I think will be quite symbolic of why he wins tournaments that frequently. Um, in 2016, after he finished his tough US championship, where he finished second behind Fabi, uh, he tied with Nakamura for second place. Um, I talked to him and his, uh, his mom, and uh, basically he says that the very next, basically the very next day, after he finished a tough, grueling tournament, he was already waking up, up at 6 a.m. and working on tactics. Like the, literally the very next day. And while other people are like drinking and partying and relaxing and uh, just trying to get rid of the energy, the very next day he's already thinking about the next tournament and worrying about how to do, how to uh, play um, better and, uh, you know, perfecting his chess, right? And this is something that Susan Polgar always talks, talked about and continues to talk about in, in our, when I was at Webster in our chess training that if you really want to be great, like not just good, but best of the best, you really have to um, put in your heart and soul, not just during the tournament, but before, because everybody have, tries hard during the tournament. Uh, but um, if you really want to be the best, and if you really want the sort of, sort of say luck to be your way and uh, for you to really be able to come on top compared to the best players, you really have to put in your heart and soul every day and be very disciplined. Like discipline, nothing replaces discipline. Like no matter how hard you try during the tournament, if you're not disciplined at home, it's, you know, there's gonna be, you're gonna have these feelings of regret when, and you know, there is nothing, there was nothing more painful for me than being at a closing ceremony and knowing I had a chance to win the tournament and watching these other people go up on, on stage, right? Um, and uh, you know it's it might be it's so I I feel like it's more less painful to train very hard and kill yourself for the game of chess almost at home, but then then to have that deflating feeling of not being not done not not having done your maximum. Um, there's nothing more unpleasant than having that feeling that you could have you could have won and and you didn't uh, because of something that you didn't. Uh, uh, do um, so um, so yeah that's that and I even made myself a, I just couldn't watch the playoff right I just uh, refused to watch it I saw the games after but I purposely scheduled the lesson while the playoff was going on so that I don't I don't watch it because feeling would be too too painful um, yeah so anyway I hope this this is instructive for you guys and if you have uh, if you're ambitious for chess please learn from me, like how, how important it is to be disciplined because, you know, that disappointment is real, right? And you don't want that to happen to you. Um, okay, I have so, so a few questions. I would, do, I, would, I would say to do that, but be more in touch with your injury. Yes, of course you have to trust your gut, right? So if you, like, let's, you know, and I tell that to a lot of my students. So let's say you've thought for like 10 minutes on a move, right? and uh, you're not sure between two moves, you should try to go with the move that you thought about originally, because that's more likely you got your gut, right? Especially if you're an adult player who has been playing chess for many years, but somehow have a hard time trusting yourself, you have to trust your gut, because the gut is correct 90 out of 10, 100 times. But um, what I mean is that when you see a good move, you know, explore all the possible moves, right? You know, it's uh, don't only, trust your intuition, especially in the beginning, right? Um, do you believe in natural talent or do you think um, it's almost all, if not all hard work? Well, I believe in both, of course, right? So if you have absolutely no natural ability for a certain thing, you should probably invest more time into something that you do have a natural ability. So if, if you see that as a chess player, you're trying very hard for, for five years playing and studying and working your tail off and you're still 1200, but like in basketball or something else, you're naturally more gifted, you probably should invest more into something else, right? Or whatever it is, like art or academics or, you know, whatever else it may be. I have to be practical and smart, right? Um, you know, so, but um, certainly, you know, we're talking about people who already reached like GM level, right? 
So everybody, of course, has who reaches GM level has to be somehow naturally talented, right? But then what differs is like how hard somebody works, right? Um, someone like Sam Shanklin, you know, before he won the US championships, he was just working his tail off on a regular basis, right? And that's why the game of chess uh, gave back to him, right? It's like working very hard with these Jacob Agard books and calculation like strains his brain, right? That's, that's what you've got to do if you really want to, um, if you really want to be the best of, of the best. It's not just in chess, in anything, in anything that you want to be, uh, in anything like you want to be the best at, you have to try to put in that effort. So if you want to be, let's say, an economics professor or a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it else may be, you have to try to be the best of the best to try to really, uh, you know, succeed in life, right? Because there's a lot of competition in any field, right? So it's it's not just with chess. It's like like this and with anything in life. Um, so let's see. Uh, am I coming to London anytime soon? Look, I think uh, I think uh, I decided for myself until the pandemic is 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 over, until we reach like an endemic stage where you don't have to deal with lockdowns, quarantines, where COVID is treated just like a normal virus, like a flu or a cold where you can live a normal life even if you have it like you don't have to sit for two weeks somewhere and get stuck or something and and the borders being closed and all these problems uh, and people dying and hospitals overflowing until that kind of thing stops I'm just not gonna travel out of the country you know so and basically until the pandemic stage of this pandemic is over I'm not traveling out of the country that's that's I, I declined the World Cup I declined the grid the Grand Swiss, which, you know, looked like was on the verge of being canceled, but looks like it's still a go. But like, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not just not taking these chances. There's just too many good tournaments in the U.S. where I don't feel the need to go out of my way and, you know, get quarantined, get stuck, having to get tested, and God forbid I test positive, and then then I'm stuck for for weeks, and I, you know, it's just uh, it's just too much for me right now. Uh, not worth it. So hopefully at some point, hopefully by the summer of next year, I'll, it'll be better and then it's gonna be okay to travel. But for now, it's still, it's like, um, I mean, I'm comfortable certainly going to places in the U US and all these things, but um, you know, it's, but, but yeah, out, out of country, it's just too uncertain. Um, yeah, well, we'll see. Um, is it necessary to work on tactics most of the time in order to get better? Um, yes, tactics, the way I look at it is tactics is like food for the brain. So, um, you know, without tactics, you can't really uh, grow as a chess player, I believe. Um, you're going to always limit yourself if you don't work on tactics. Tactics is something you have to do every day. Even if you don't have time for anything else, you have to do tactics every day. Now, you should try to do other things as well, if possible, but tactics is like the number one requirement. Um, how do you develop in long calculation and also being able to find good candidate moves? Yeah, I think it's discipline. I think one thing that's important is making candidate moves and not starting to calculate deeply before you make a list of candidate moves, right? Because then you can get sucked in into some interesting lines and, and missing something simple on move one for yourself or your opponent, right? So as Mark Dvoretsky, the late Mark Dvoretsky would say, as long as you can see every, you know, the main things on move one or move two, you're usually gonna have pretty good calculation, right? So I think that's general advice, um, pretty common. Of course, we all sometimes fall in that trap and we start getting, analyzing something too deeply. The breadth of search. Yes, um, and um, yeah, but I think it's just a lot of training and maybe if you feel like you can get, if you feel like you got stuck somehow at your tactics or calculation level, maybe uh, if you have a coach, that could be something you can talk to them about. Maybe download the problems you get wrong and go over them and see maybe you, there's a pattern in your thinking that you need to improve. Because I know that Sam Shanklin, for example, has pretty much the way he got better from like 2620 level to like 2700 level. He worked with Jacob Agard primarily on calculation. Right? And Jake Agar basically tailored problems towards him and uh, he basically helped Sh Sam realize how he needed to work on his calculation and, and now he became just so good at it, right? And, 
and he became such a much better player. Um, so, okay, um, is it possible that the Savian game was too exhausting? No, actually, I was not that exhausted about the game after the game was an end game. Actually, I always felt fresh. I physically, I, somehow, I always felt pretty good. Like, I don't think physical stamina actually had to do with uh, um, my mistakes. I think it's just like I wasn't creative. I think that's the problem. I wasn't uh, thinking the right way about moves. I wasn't thinking outside the box. Uh, yes, I'm definitely disappointed not to win. I mean, especially when plus two wins and you score plus one. It's very disappointing. It's, it's when you have a chance, like so many chances to win, like just one more game. Of course, it's very disappointing. What's the shortest time limit for an adult improver to play regularly to actually improve? Well, I think it depends on what their level is. If you're an adult improver and you're 1200, yes, you can improve very quickly to like 2000 level, I think, especially if you have some natural talent and you're training the right way. If you're an adult and you're 2000 trying to become 2200, it's much harder. It's going to take you much longer. So I think it depends on what level you're starting and how much, how much exact time you're, you're your training. So again, it's a very general question, hard to say an exact answer. All right, I think it's time for me to, oh, why is Carlson so dominant? What makes him different? Is it natural talent or hard work? Well, I think both. I think both. And I think, well, there's actually, I have one opinion about Carlson, which is not something that people say a lot, but I'll say it. He very rarely drifts um, during games. Like, I've seen Fabi choose a wrong plan and, like, make a series of bad moves. I've seen Wesley do it. I've seen Hikaru do it. I've seen most elite players do it. I almost never see Carlson drift. Like, Carlson blunders. Sure, everybody blunders. Carlson could misjudge some dynamics in the position. He can misplay an opening. Yeah, he can do these things. But he almost never, you know, just completely loses the threat of the game. Like, well, I do it all the time. Like, all these other elite players do it a lot. Well, not a lot, but relatively speaking. Carlson, maybe not tilt, but just like losing the thread of the position, like just not understanding like how to play a certain position. Magnus, on the other hand, I almost never see him like play a series of just bad moves in a row. Like he can make a blunder, yes, but not like showing lack of understanding of the of the position. Like that's that's the part he's just really really good at. Like he's in that sense, I think he's by far the better player than others. But, of course, that's only one factor, right? That's... Um, all right, well, I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed this. Um, and um, yeah, I'll see you guys next time.